I'm happy today to be talking to Tony Sampson about his book, The Assemblage Brain, Sense-Making in Neuroculture. And Tony, I thought maybe we could start with a big picture question, which is when you think about the future of human-computer interaction, which is really sort of what your book is about, what are you most excited about on a personal level and what are you most worried about? I would say that, you know, as far as the things that I'm looking forward to, um, yeah, there's immense potential, isn't there, with uh, human-computer interaction. It's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there's some interesting stuff this morning uh, on the British TV about, um, you know, addiction. And there's a, you know, it's a, it's a nebulous term, isn't it, computer in, in, uh, addiction. We don't really would have to kind of think through very carefully the kind of, you know, the amount of people who are going to be impacted by that and the amount of people who really you know, enjoy using computers like you and me at the moment, communicating across distance. It's great. Mm-hmm. But uh, the book itself is a, is a bit of a cautionary tale for when things like that might go wrong. And a lot of my work, particularly, you know, more recent work, in fact, around things like uh, addiction, uh, the idea of being hooked and the way that design works to hook people using apps, computer games. I would say that's probably the bleaker picture. You know, so uh, that's that's my focus with design, and uh, that's why I'm interested in the design of, of computing and computer interaction. When as I was reading it, some some of the time I was thinking, wow, you know, the future, the way the technology has changed in the last ten, twenty years has been really incredible. But then I also started to really worry, uh, especially yeah, the things that you mentioned about the way that we kind of lose our ability to navigate, uh, especially in less conscious ways, that ways that we don't even realize i guess uh, i'm curious you spend a lot of time looking at this you spend a lot of time analyzing these sort of worst case scenarios or or just problems that may occur how do you feel about uh how do you feel about technology in general i think the book feels very uh sort of objective and i couldn't get a good sense of whether or not you are a sort of optimist or pessimist because the book has both aspects i'm wondering how you see yourself no, really. I, I, I would have thought most, most people say it's very dystopian. <laughs> I'd, I'd be interested to push you a little bit on finding out where you think I'm optimistic. But uh, I tend to write in a very kind of, uh, you know, dystopian kind of way. I, I, I'm stuck to try and think where, where the optimism is there. But um, <laughs> I guess what I was thinking, though, is that you're spending, I mean, I assume you're pretty much spending your life dedicated to these kinds of questions, which I can't imagine somebody doing if they think it's... Uh, it's going in the wrong direction and there's no there's no hope so i feel like just the very fact that you are so involved in these debates makes me think that you think that you know there's a there's a brighter future maybe that you're contributing to pushing us in that direction i don't know maybe that's just me yeah well it, it's an ethical kind of move isn't it there but um I, I must say you know criticizing my own work i'm often stuck to come up with solutions to some of the problems but um yeah, my, my work is kind of a mixture of, A, focusing on technology, which is kind of like my bread and butter work at, at university, and, and B, this kind of deep interest in philosophy, and particularly, you know, on, ontology. And so, really, you know, I, I look at the kind of ontological facets of, of being online and communicating through, through new technology, and uh, a lot of conclusions I come up with, and particularly, you know, drawing on examples uh, is that it is more dystopian than, than utopian. Well, and you actually approach it through this idea of uh, of dystopia. And I was wondering, I mean, of all of all the things that you could use, you do return a lot to uh, like Brave New World and these kinds of dystopian fictions. What do, what do those give you? Why do you keep returning or why do you use these fictional works? What What do they help you see or what do they help you think through? Okay, I was, I was interested because yeah, there was there was a debate going on in the uh, British press. I, I presume similar debates might have occurred over there as well, which you know, post Brexit, post Trump, uh, there was debate around whether we we're in Brave New World or whether we're in um, yeah. uh, 1984. You know, whether whether this is Orwellian or or, or Huxley, um, and I, I was really interested in reading that because in my own area, which is broadly speaking, kind of new materialism, affect theory. I was trying to think which one resonated more with with that account, and you know I started reading, going back to Scott A level texts, really looking at um, you know Huxley and Orwell, and you know all, uh, sorry Huxley is a you know deeply uh, affect theory uh, orientated uh, dystopian, 
you know, compared to um, the kind of more language driven, uh, you know, structuralist kind of uh, 1984 with all its focus on, you know, subverting language, etc. And that, that those were sort of debates which were coming through in the, in the press. And of course, you know, Neil, Neil Postman did a, a very similar job a long time ago. So what I tried to do is revisit that and think through Huxley's affective appeals to uh, control and power. And, uh, you know, I don't know how deep you want to get here, but one of the actual other driving forces behind it is, of course, is Deleuze's um, uh, control society, which is mm -hmm. quite famously influenced by William Burroughs. And I didn't want to just cover that kind of usual ground around Burroughs, so I thought I'd introduce the other kind of uh, dystopias to kind of mix it up a little bit. No, I find it really interesting because uh, I think a lot of the stuff I, I read that has that relates to this kind of uh, field is very much uh, sort of technology and almost engineering driven about you know what's possible, what are people doing, what are the advances and stuff like that. And so to to go from that, which is very sort of um, grounded in a sort of scientific approach, and then to think about it sort of more of a literary thing of uh, Huxley and Orwell and others, uh, I found that interesting, especially because a lot of the stuff that you're referring to in terms of technology is very much uh, grounded in a sort of scientific approach. And so uh, to to refer back to something that is, uh, you know, fictional, even though it's obviously related and uh, important in, in how we view our world, I found that to be interesting in somebody doing research on uh, talking about brain scanning and the, the kind of human computer interfaces and interactions that we use. Uh, it was interesting to hear a sort of literary, almost a literary analysis in, in a way. Sure, yeah. Although, you know, I, some of my stuff is quite technical and scientific. Um, you know, I, I take a lot from HCI, uh, I can't remember it's chapter one or, or, or two or three, sorry. But um, it, it, what I wanted to do really is, is sort of slip in between these kind of worlds, you know. So you, at one point you had a very kind of scientific analysis of, say, EEG, uh, or, you know, different types of uh, neuropharmaceuticals, which, you know, I kind of got in, stuck into quite a lot of detail. But then to drift out and, you know, is it fabulation, they call it, when you start thinking through fiction as a way to, uh, you know, analyse what's really going on, the sort of stuff that, uh, you know, Stephen Shaviro does in Dis Discognition. Yeah, yeah. No, and I found that really interesting. It actually made me wonder, uh, because, you know, we haven't met, I, I, I've just contacted you in, after reading your book, um, I was wondering who you like to hang out with in terms of associations or conferences and stuff like that, because ba just based on this book, I, f I was thinking I can only imagine you at a sort of neuroscience uh, conference or something dealing with uh, uh, neurotechnology uh, cognition and pulling out Deleuze and critical theory, and uh, I can't imagine that necessarily going that well or a lot of people being conversant. <laughs> at, at the same time, though, if you were at a cultural studies or critical theory conference – uh, and dealing with such scientific uh, and, and neurological and, and, and cognitive science, I can't imagine a lot of people would be able to follow you. So I was wondering where, you, how you position yourself in in different academic circles. Well, I suppose the answer to that, Chris, is I don't hang around with anybody <laughs> <laughs> for that, for those reasons. Well, no, um, you know, the area I, I'm involved in really are people who have embraced technology in, in, a, in a big way, and they they're not uh, neuroscientists or engineers. Uh, I think you're spot on there. I mean, they would struggle to understand a lot of the language I'm using. I've always been interested, and one of the people who reviewed the books through Minnesota was a neuroscientist. And actually, he, he was quite positive about certain aspects of it. You know, you, you always risk there that they're going to get, dig into some sort of detail. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm always with Deleuze in that sense. That you can do a kind of non-scientific reading of science and get away with it. After all, there's a lot of scientists doing philosophy in pretty ropey ways as well. So, you know, we need confidence to steer forward with that and not ignore it. But, you know, I, I, I don't think on the other side that kind of critical theory, uh, philosophy, particularly around affect theory, people embrace technology and science all the time. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, for example, you know, Matt Fuller and, uh, you know, uh, software studies here. Mm. You know, they're really interested in working with and working around code, uh, talking about technology. There are other people who work with technologists uh, to produce work, which is critical in terms of design. Uh, so it's, it's not so alien to me, that, that side. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, I've had some difficult uh, you know, guest talks 
uh, where yeah, <laughs> I think I've been speaking to people who are more scientifically minded and they have a certain set of issues around my work. And, you know, of course, I've bumped into those sort of cultural studies types who are quite alien to having any kind of scientific ideas within the humanities. But um, that's that's a challenge anyway, isn't it? Yeah, well, and I think that you're doing exactly what uh, what good researchers should be, is, which is engaging in multiple fields so that you can kind of come up with something unique and insightful using one against the other or with the other. Sure, and, and of course the book you know, begins with this idea around the interference, which uh, is something I've been doing a lot more on recently because... I don't know about in the States, but the you know, big buzzword here is, you know, getting out of our silos, uh, becoming more interdisciplinary, more cross-disciplinary. You know, that's where the innovation in the universities uh, seems to be, we're told. Mm -hmm. uh, so the whole idea of kind of, you know, dealing with the interference between disciplines and uh, going back to uh, Deleuze and Guattari's um, uh, What is Philosophy really kick-started all that. In fact, you know, it's funny you should mention it. I know the, the, the book itself was inspired really by some criticism I had from a, a particular kind of theorist, social theorist, I suppose, who, who criticised my use of uh, mirror neuron to dis describe one way in which we might think about uh, the role of imitation in communication. Uh, it, was a, it was a very brief kind of mention, and, you know, perhaps the criticism had, you know, had, had a good point to it. But uh, in a way, the whole of that, Kind of well, now I'm going to kind of address this thing about mirror neurons and spin up the whole kind of neurological uh, side of my research. That, that that that's really where it, where it all began. So you know, these ideas of crossing and interfering between disciplines is is, is really important to the book. Yeah, no, and I think uh, I think like I said, you're a good example of this because the the fear, I guess, uh, and clearly what I've read in in not so great work is people who really don't understand science and want to just throw in a few scientific buzzwords. Uh, Barabe actually writes a good um, analysis of this, Michael Barabe, about how uh, there is probably a good reason why certain people shouldn't, or at least don't do it well enough, you know, to, to go from critical cultural studies and to throw in some scientific things that don't really make so much sense. And uh, like you said, there are there are scientists who throw in a philosophical term or or degrade maybe a philosophical term, and it, the engagement really isn't there, and that's when these things fall apart. And I, I guess that's always the fear is that reading something that engages in these two, you know, pretty difficult disciplines to enter and to really understand. Um, there's a lot of room for, I guess, sort of one-sidedness, but um, that makes me wonder, how do you approach critical interference as a method? Like, if you were going to explain or give tips to somebody who wanted to employ this this method? How, how do you go about doing it? Well, yeah, I've been writing about that a lot more. Uh, just, just just to say, yeah, thank, thanks for saying that, about the, you know, engaging with science. And I, I grasp exactly what you mean about some works that kind of mm -hmm. just throw in an odd technical term. You know, I, I'm glad you think it works. I must say that, you know, I was driven purely by this idea that if you look, especially around a lot of uh, neuroscientific work, there is an attack on philosophy going on. Uh, from inside neuroscience and you know this idea that we can do a kind of non-scientific reading of science I mean I'm not a scientist I'm not an engineer my mind doesn't work like that but um, it doesn't stop me getting involved in the detail the best I possibly can and uh, I really appreciate you you picking up on that point yeah no definitely you know I, I, I think there is a, a, a bit of a, a kind of struggle going on in terms of interferences I've been writing about it in another article uh, just submitted for a, a book it's not going to come out for probably another <laughs> another while but um yeah you know, my idea there is well okay you can start mixing up things and looking at the kind of mixtures disciplinary mixtures but what is interesting about you know Deleuze and Qatari's book is they were really cautious about doing that so one of the points I make there is, well, why? Why were they cautious? You know, they were always looked upon as what you know Stenger's calls the kind of uh, philosophers of mixture. You know, everything could mix. So uh, why, in their kind of swan song, did they suddenly say, well, hang on, you know, there are there are discrete disciplines and they can only mix within this kind of certain ways. You know, there are different interferences, as you might recall if you read the book. Um, but you know, why, why is this tension? Why? why? And of course, you know, one of the overriding problems we, we face today is, is, is keeping criticality there. 
And I'm, I'm really interested in when things do mix, i.e. when the uh, cultural theorist or artist does work with a scientist or the engineer, to what extent can criticality survive in that relationship, in that mixture? And uh, yeah, I, I think there's, a, uh, there's an element of threat in there. Uh, there's an element of dressing up particular approaches that you might want to uh, uh, put forward, say, for funding, for research, which have an inbuilt criticality, but as soon as you mix with another discipline, say engineering or science, that might become watered down by necessity to get the money, for example. So, yeah, there's some really interesting debates around that, which go beyond just the idea of kind of mixing disciplines and doing a bit of science in cultural theory. I'm curious also, I guess... Um, how do you balance looking into these things from, well, like you said, a, a sort of pessimistic or dystopian framework? How do you balance that with, uh, I mean, do you try to be somewhat objective as you're looking at this, or do you try to look at it from a particular lens, uh, Deleuze or Marx or whomever? Um, when you're approaching sort of critical issues, right, how do you how do you approach it, and is there an attempt to sort of be open minded? I, you know, you probably have to explain a little bit about my background. Mm -hmm. I, I began as a kind of Marxist media theorist, really. <clears throat> so as far as I could tell at the time, was most accounts of technology were kind of rosy garden kind of technologies uh, and approaches. So you know, everything was presented to you before you kind of started reading this material. In a, in a very sort of positive light. Uh, I wrote a, uh, or co-edited a book with Yussi Parika a while ago called The Spam Book. And uh, we, we thought at the time that that was one of the first kind of books, one of the unique things about it, to kind of present the antithesis of, you know, Bill Gates' road ahead. Because everything was, you know, how wonderful this thing's going to be, how, how it's going to roll out, how we're going to all become connected. And of course, there's a lot of, you know, ugly, uh, weed-like things going on in the background that needed uh, some light shed on. So, you know, I started writing around uh, issues around computer viruses. So I suppose I've always had this kind of tendency to look at the kind of poor, I mean, we called it the dark side, not because we thought it was dark as it, you know, in some kind of metaphorical sense, but literally it was dark because nobody bothered actually shining a light on it. So, <clears throat> so you know, that, that was a transition from looking at things from a very critical Marxist point of view transitioning into what we broadly call now, you know, digital culture, uh, informed by what I brought, you know, again, broadly calls kind of new materialist affect theory approach. But, um, you know, I, 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 I'd like to think that I am open, but I must admit that, you know, one criticism I'd have of myself and, you know, I'm sure other people who would read the book and say the same thing is that it is overridingly uh, dystopian. Yeah, well, and I think that that's been something that I've noticed in the last, uh, I don't know, decade or probably more, depending on, on what kind of framework you're using. But yeah, there is definitely the Bill Gates rosy approach of, um, you know, the greatness that we will be able to achieve. And this is obviously for for various reasons, commercial reasons, the kind of um, selling point of Apple and Google and these kinds of companies is that, you know, every year it's getting better, we're going into a better future, and there was definitely a lack of uh, sort of critical insight until that kind of stuff did start to appear. And then I felt like there was just a barrage of anytime you hear about technology, yeah. you're going to hear about the world, world ending or, or something like that. And so I, I find it hard myself to uh, to. F to, to know where is a sort of appropriate uh, uh, way of approaching something. It's a matter of perspective, though, isn't it? Because, you know, if, if obviously in your position, you're reading a lot more material that a lot of other people aren't getting access to, uh, which you've got quite a pri privileged position there. When I started out, you know, I, I, I was quite inexperienced in terms of uh, reading about technology. Uh, this took about my first degree. And once I was introduced to criticality through Marxist media theory, it opened up a kind of whole different world to me. Mm. And although I feel very similar to you that, uh, you know, everything's pretty down and, you know, especially with a sort of look at, say, Donald Trump's tweets, for example, you know, the whole technology seems very bleak. But there are a lot of people out there who don't see it like that. So I suppose, you know, it's, I, I, do, I try and do things that are not just academic books, but, you know, filter stuff out through other 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 ways, other channels, same pretty much the same kind of message. Really, we do some quite a lot of public engagement events uh, in, in where I live in Essex, which is just outside London. And you know, you'd be surprised that people aren't getting the same kind of negative messages that you're you know being kind of subsumed in. 
Um, so I think it's still, you know, a, a, a real need to keep on pumping out some of that stuff. No, and that's, I guess, one of the challenges is uh, talking to different communities and speaking within different communities because, uh, well, like you and your work, right, there's, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people in neuroscience in particular who are really optimistic and the answer, to, uh, you sort of say in your book, right, the answer to everything from some people's perspective is, yeah, more neuroscience or more, potentially more invasive technology and that kind of thing, whereas uh, there's definitely a need for a counterbalance to those arguments. Yeah. It reminds me, though, of, uh, of an experience I had. So I teach, uh, among other things, uh, film theory class, and I've taught it for a few years now. And the first year I taught it, I showed this uh, this uh, fMRI that they are doing on people who are watching, I believe it was Avatar at the time, James Cameron's Avatar. And so they're doing these fMRI tests on people to make sure that they're engaging them so thoroughly that, uh, you know, I don't know, dopamine levels are opening up and... Um, and that they're really hitting these centers of the brain that they want so that they create as much significance in terms of their uh, what they're perceiving as possible. And so they'll do a bunch of versions. I'm sure you're aware of this kind of thing, right? They do, yeah, sure. they do a bunch yeah, yeah. of versions of a uh, trailer, for example. They, they watch people's brains in, uh, in real time and see which ones are the most effective. And then they pump those out into the commercials and TV and stuff like that. And so when I showed uh, my students this a few years ago, I think there was what I would expect, uh, which was kind of concern and uh, feeling of sort of uh, invasiveness and these kinds of things. Whereas this last term, I showed this same kind of video and people didn't really seem worried about it. Like the students were uh, were like, yeah, that's, you know, that's just a natural progression of advertising. And I don't particularly mind. And that I, I would assume that they're doing this kind of thing, which to me was really surprising. And I'm just wondering how you uh, how you find the that generally people are responding to this kind of thing. And uh, it made me step back for a second and think like, am I reading too much critical stuff and that um, I'm overly worried and naturally approaching this as this is a bad thing? Or are these students uh, as representatives of a sort of uh, bit younger generation, are they, are they being exposed too much to this where it's just become uh, another thing that, they're dealing with that it is a non-issue for them, but perhaps should be, I guess. Sure. Yeah. This is, yeah. this is where I'm getting at for this, uh, yeah. this approach, right? I'm wondering, am I, am I sort of too negative or are we too negative? How do we know that this is something we should worry about? And how do you explain that to someone who's, uh, just like, yeah, this is just another privacy agreement that I'll have to click on to use the app. Yeah. In a, you know, in a real practical way, I, I work with uh, design students, uh, a lot, um, in my kind of day job. And I, I've shown very similar uh, films, you know, with um, different like EEG or uh, fMRI mm -hmm. being used, uh, for, you know, to look at films or, you know, using things like uh, eye tracking to look at people's attention. And, and I, I think I've noticed a, 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 a very similar shift to you, you know, from people being kind of concerned about the invasiveness of it to not mm -hmm. being really that concerned. And actually, perhaps, <clears throat> and this isn't just students either, this is, um, you know, other designers, a, a large amount of excitement about it as well, what it can do. Um, I suppose in a more sober way, you know, just to kind of turn the conversation around a little bit, what, I, what I'm interested in is actually the kind of, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the basis of, of this stuff. What, what does it actually mean? And I don't, I don't know whether you've looked in the book at all about the um, the picture of the mouse where he's, where he's having his... Um, he or she having um, their um, uh, whiskers uh, stimulated, and then that that would then uh, correspond to an individual neuron. And so, you know, this is kind of a kickstarting of the idea. Well, if you could, you know, map up some kind of sensation, external sensation, to a particular neuron, you can start to read the brain. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these things you're describing are, you know, if one part of the brain is kind of lit up then people are really excited by this. And their, their attention is, is focused on this particular film you're showing. But um, there's a long journey, really, between that kind of sensational level, that, that kind of stimulation of the whisker, and a particular part of the brain which might light up in, uh, in these tests, to, 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 to the idea of concepts and people actually thinking up ideas. So I, I think a lot of the stuff I try to do is firstly showing, look, here is this stuff. Isn't it invasive? And we try and discuss the ethics of that with students. And yeah, you you meet this kind of you know uh, panoply of of, of 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 you know either disinterest, 
you know, fear and paranoia right away around to kind of excitement and this isn't this fantastic but uh, the one i want to really get across to them is just you know how valid it is is this stuff is it really as scary as as, as you might think you know what is the kind of science behind it and a lot of the times the science is is more unstable than, than you're led to believe so i, I just think there's an interesting dimension that uh, quite often the science claims to be doing one thing but uh, in fact a lot of the time it's just marketing within itself in a way yeah and it has been interesting to see how how often uh i, I wasn't really aware until i read this book uh, how often people are claiming to do neuro stuff. So basically you just put neuro in front of things uh, and then you get, yeah, you get neuro design and neuro this and neuro that. And, and in many cases, it's not necessarily that, that different, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work lately around the influence of uh, Damasio, you know, it's sort of writ large amongst all kinds of different disciplines. Um, I'm just doing comparing Catherine Howe's uh, new book, with you know the kind of tendency in uh, affect theory to use um, uh, Antonio Damasio's neuroscience, and really you know there's just so many different readings of it and so many different interpretations that uh, it, it it becomes very difficult to tell where the original started and then what what it spins out to, and that's that's in you know in in our kind of work. I think once you get the marketing, some of the, the seminars I went to years ago to to listen about brains, you know, when I was doing the research into the book, it was atrocious. I mean, they, you know, it really was very light touch neuroscience, but with a lot of kind of uh, hype and, uh, you know, promises to clients that we're going to kind of, you know, tap into something that your clients won't tell you because the brain never lies, you know, that sort of rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's interesting to kind of approach it from all different, all different ways. Look at the science, look at the science very closely, run through fictional dystopian accounts which kind of you know tell a future where if this stuff does work then this is what it could be like uh but also you know keep a, 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 a you know a firm kind of cynicism in place uh -huh. when listening to the kind of hype yeah and i think that's yeah that's def definitely important and something that sometimes we just don't have time to really look into which uh uh yeah with your stuff for example uh a lot of it i didn't uh, I wasn't really aware of, especially with the the neuroscience aspect, but the way that you uh, combine it, I thought was really interesting and uh, helpful for me, for someone who's not that aware of the the neuroscience that's going on and the discourses that are going on in relation to it. Sure, yeah, I, I hope you noticed that part of it because you know I did read quite a lot of neuroscientific theory. You know, there's a whole different world there opening up, uh, and the debates within within neuroscience itself are absolutely amazing. So, you know, it, it, it is a book that tries to, you know, mix itself to try and get in there. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you picked up on that anyway. Well, yeah. and luckily, I guess for me, that uh, I, had, I had not a lot of idea about the neuroscience behind it, but I did, I was familiar and I had read the other stuff, uh, Deleuze and other things, Foucault and the people you mentioned. So I could follow along with that, which sure. I found really helpful because, yeah, like I said, a lot of the time I can read I can read other accounts of Foucault or Deleuze, but the uh, information won't be as informative in relation to the whatever it's being applied to. So in this case, neuroscience. Um, what, what, if anything, I guess, uh, would you say that we're moving towards considering, you know, you talk in the book about Foucault's um, discipline and, uh, and the control society of Deleuze. Would you say that... Um, would you say that there is some kind of change beyond the control society, or would you say that it's sort of uh, simply Deleuze's ideas coming to fruition in a, in a sense? Yeah, <clears throat> well, to, to some extent. So uh, I, I don't like uh, answering questions, Chris, where people say, <laughs> do, you know, do you know what's yeah. coming? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've got to say I haven't got a clue. But um, all I can say is that, you know, for, for the work I've been doing, I'm more and more convinced that, we need to take this stuff seriously. So, yeah, there's an air of cynicism and there's an air of hype. And, you know, we need to be cautious. And particularly when we start using lots of different you know, sources to draw into our work and then say, well, look, this is what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, one of the things that uh, the control society does, it, it, it talks about, um, you know, people giving up themselves to power. You know, it, it, power, power is kind of invisible. It's an acquiescence, isn't it, to, to, to sort of power. So on one side, you know, you've got that kind of dominating threat, but you've also got this thing where people welcome being controlled in that way. 
And that to me is, is dangerous. And that to me is where we start operating in a kind of neurological area that can probably learn something from neuroscience, can probably learn something from, you know, the ideas around neurochemicals, can probably learn something from brain imaging. But we, we have to be very cautious. But yeah, I mean, the whole book is, uh, is, is looking out, looking at how, um, you know, the control society is spinning out in different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, reading this made me go back to Deleuze, which I'd read before, but then uh, seeing it in this light, I had to I had to look at it again. And it was, I mean, it's alarming. And at the same time, so I feel like I'm, learn I'm learning things that are valuable and I wouldn't want to not know, even though, you, you know, there is this kind of idea of ignorance being bliss. And so if I didn't know that all these invasive things were happening... I wouldn't be as worried about it, but I am glad that I know about some of the invasive and problematic ways that people are using or marketing or, or trying to sort of suck our energies or mental energies so that we focus on, you know, this product or, or this thing as opposed to, I guess, thinking for ourselves or thinking about about things that are not put into our heads in various ways that we don't necessarily understand. I mean, if you had any advice, and I know you said you, do, you don't necessarily have a lot of solutions as you're looking at this stuff but if you if you had to do or change something about the way the average person uh works and behaves especially in order to sort of avoid this complete control society i know there's no there's no outside of power if you follow that line of thinking yeah sure but there is resistances um what would you do or what would you recommend to people to to resist this kind of uh giving over our brains and our our thoughts to to power Sure. Okay. Well, you know, as I said initially, we we started writing around things like computer viruses and looking for alternative ways of of doing computing. Uh, that that didn't take off very well. <laughs> but uh, because I, I I focus more on affect theory, I, I think probably the thing that resonates with me most about some sort of advice for people is uh, around Teresa Brenham's idea of the education of the senses. So a lot of the reason why I think people become uh, controlled by these things without without really knowing that they're being controlled, why they become hooked, why they become you know addicted, why they become compulsive, their attention is drawn all the time to things, probably without them mostly realizing that in a, in a, a very conscious way, mm -hmm. is because of the way that they're, they're, they're affected. So, and it seems to me that there's a lack of uh, awareness, not just about you know how you think rationally about things, but how, how things affect you, how um, your senses uh, are so important to your kind of day-to-day -day existence. And I, I don't know if you've ever read Teresa Brenham's uh, Transmission of Effect, but there's some really nice things in there about you know, how we might go about uh, educating our senses to become more, more aware of ourselves outside of those kind of rational cognitive models that we're, we're very familiar with. Hmm. So, you know, it sounds, sounds a bit crazy, but... Um, you know, I, I, as I said, I work a lot with design students and I do a lot of work on emotional design, affective computing, talking about the kind of change between the rational kind of model of computing, the IBM model, to what we've got now with, you know, Mac, and the whole kind of, you know, internet um, kind of age, which to me involves a lot more of a kind of sensual uh, experiences than that kind of old model of rational computing. And, you know, it gets through to people in some interesting ways. I think people like to talk about their senses as well as their kind of, you know, uh, cognitive, cognitive uh, psychology. And I think they start understanding and seeing things in, in very different ways or not, not just seeing things, experiencing things in very different ways, feeling things in very different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's definitely a turn in the, in the last uh, decade or so that I, obviously the effective turn, if you want to call it that, is uh is opening up lines for that that's the, yeah, the book you mentioned i need to check that out well you say in the you say in the book which resonated with me that free unmediated brain time is in decline and that's something that i mean i, I wasn't using those words but just talking to friends a few days ago we we seem to come to that conclusion basically that uh, one of my friends who teaches in education 
she uh, was doing this project or whatever that involved just writing down what she was doing, I think, every 15 minutes or something on certain days to get a sense of how she spends her time. And what she realized was that she doesn't do the same thing for more than about 15 minutes. So she's always moving from either one crisis to another in the in the school or, or in whatever. But there's not what she noticed, I guess, in this uh, in this project was that she doesn't have a lot of uh, time to just like sit and think or to work on something for an extended period of time. And I'm wondering, especially after reading the things that you you mentioned here, where where if anywhere do you find or might you find free unmediated brain time? And I guess how would you know is my concern after reading your book because it seems like there are a lot of invasive things that I didn't even know were invasive. And so um, you know, for instance, desires for certain things or the ability to uh, to want or to concentrate or to do these things. Where, if anywhere, can we get free, unmediated brain time so that we can try to, um, I guess, find more of, of this space? Well, OK. I, <laughs> I, well, I think it's probably virtually impossible for most people. Um, I'm in a lucky position because, you know, I'm, I'm not, not that young. And uh, I managed to refuse to have a mobile phone. I've, I've never had a mobile phone. I, it's not that I don't use digital technology. You know, I use laptops and tablets, and I'm on, on them far too much. But I, but I do have periods of time, i.e., when I get on to, onto a train where I don't have a mobile phone to look at, so I can sit there in a train carriage, look out the window, and of course there's some sort of mediation going on there. But uh, it's free from the kind of mediation which seems to consume most of us most of the time. So uh, yeah, I'm a kind of a, a experiment on how you can do that. Um, I think there's a growing interest in that kind of thing. I, uh, I was involved in a, 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 a seminar recently, a launch of a book uh, dedicated to the idea of internet and uh, you know, digital uh, addiction. And you'd be surprised the kind of things that are going on, you know, boot camps where people can detox from from digital uh, lives and some really interesting artworks which are kind of engaging with that. And, you know, when you talk to people, they, they, they're aware that these things are not, you know, glorious. They're not the road ahead. There are a great deal of anxieties. You know, I've got uh, fairly young kids who have grown up with this stuff. And uh, it's really interesting to hear their kind of modes of resistance, actually. I mean, a lot of them, you know, work within these systems. They don't they do not do what I do. It's got to step out and, you know, it's a Luddite kind of, uh, neo-Luddite kind of position that I've, I've managed to take. But they work within and they find ways of, of resisting within 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 these systems. One of the uh, interesting things we do with uh, students at uh, UEL is we go through a, a design process suggested in the book Hooked, which I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. Mm-hmm. But it is a really interesting you know, book, which apparently is very popular in uh, Silicon Valley. And it tells you, you know, how to um, use a quite crude behaviorist technique, I suppose, to get people to use your, um, your apps in a more compulsive way. You know, there's not the sort of idea around design and addiction is, is nothing new. But uh, there was quite a lot of publicity recently uh, in the UK. The Guardian published an article where a number of uh, high profile Silicon Valley types involved in Facebook, one of them was involved in designing the, the like button, you know, of, of kind of themselves are wanting to step away from these things and, and, and cut, cut that particular uh, compulsive side of the digitality out of their lives. So, you know, I. Although I think it's you know fairly impossible to escape entirely, um, there are modes. You know, maybe this is the optimism that you were you were looking for. Uh, mm-hmm. There are ways to to escape for a while. That's definitely something that like um, unplugging is something that's become more and more popular as a as a way of escaping this thing, and of just gaining a little bit of insight or time. Uh, which I think is getting harder for people in general because uh, I know that even uh, me and my partner, we were talking about how how difficult it is to just sit and read without checking an email or without doing whatever. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so, yeah, it's almost like practice uh, or mindfulness, I, I know, is another thing that's becoming more and more uh, popular in circles that it wasn't before because uh, we're realizing how important that is. But um yeah, actually, well, let's go back to this idea of optimism for a second. So, I'm curious if uh, if you've thought about this or if you if you have any insights now. Um, 
if there is such a possibility of this these dystopian futures and if technology is becoming more invasive and uh, problematic why do you dedicate so much time to thinking about it and to engaging with it i feel like there is some kind of at least i was picking up some kind of hidden optimism in just the very fact that you're so engaged in these debates but i'm curious uh, why would you say you you do this as opposed to i mean if it is all dystopian I personally would try to avoid it and not think about it or to try to, I guess, focus my attention elsewhere. But the fact that you're focusing so much attention on this, to me, speaks to some kind of optimism. I'm, one, I'm wondering, why why do you do it? Why do you why do you focus so much on it? On, on technology itself? or Yeah, on, on technology and thinking through these possible scenarios that uh, obviously, in many cases, we would want to avoid. But at the same time, I guess, what's the driving force behind this research? Well, okay. I, I... I've worked with um, technology for, for a number of years. So I've worked with students who, you know, code or design uh, technology around particularly apps these days, and, you know, whatever kind of uh, you know, Internet of Things type technologies that they're interested in. And so I've always been kind of there with technology, working with technology. So my remit in the last kind of, you know, probably decade has been to try and think of some way in which we can add some context to that. So rather than just teaching people just how to code or just how to design, is how can we add, add some context? So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a, really a matter of me deciding to do a particular kind of thing more than it is me having to think of ways in which to develop context around these things. My, my approach to design students and technology students is just to say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? you ever thought about this you know different ways of thinking about your involvement in technology so i don't really teach uh dystopian media theory to uh to design students all i do is really as part of a process of teaching them around maybe a particular kind of design technique is to just bolt on the end some sort of ethical kind of uh you know idea around that i to be really honest with you here that's really how i've developed the books because, um, you know, that's just span out into more deeper kind of thinking and deeper ideas about that. The fact that it comes around and interests someone like yourself, which is great, is uh, kind of, in a way, a bit accidental in, in that sense. <laughs> you know, I, there, is no, there is no plan in that sense. Yeah. But, I, you know, so I, I've always worked in a very kind of optimistic environment, in fact, around technology. So it gets back to my point I said to you originally, that out, out there in the, you know, in the world outside cultural studies, perhaps, there is a lot of optimism around technology or a lot of, we might, you know, you might call it blind optimism. Uh, you might say a lot of it's justified. A lot of people love this stuff and enjoy it, don't they? Mm -hmm. I, I suppose my big question to them is, well, okay, you enjoy it, you love it, but have you ever thought about, you know, some other aspects of it? You know, it, it's, it's no deeper than that, really. Well, I mean, I think that's a good enough reason. Yeah, I, I've got to think that, I've got to say rather that, um, there are lots of contradictions in what I do. I just in a, on a personal level, you know, I'm a bit of a kind of a, a strange attitude towards technology at home. You know, this not having a mobile phone is quite unusual, and a lot of people remark about it being very unusual. Mm. But with with my kids, we we tend to sort of regulate or try to regulate at least some of their consumption. But I mean, you know, I, I notice contradictions in my own existence there because I'll be sitting in front of a television, telling them to get their nose out of their their mobile phone. Yeah, yeah, and it, 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 <laughs> they're the first ones to point out that Dad, you know, you're, you're watching TV, telling us to stop doing this. So you, you, I suppose, you know, all the dystopian kind of viewpoint I've got of it is informed very much by the context in which I find myself in, in terms of who I am, you know, the age I am. And my experiences. It reminds me, actually. I don't know if this is a sort of urban legend or if it's uh, if it's accurate, but I did hear that Marsha McLuhan, who you know is uh, is famous for being on the edge of technology at the time and for uh, really engaging in these new new ways of thinking and doing things, was at the same time very much adamant that his kids shouldn't be watching TV. He banned his kids from watching TV. Uh, <laughs> That's so, brilliant. I, again, I'm, let's I, hope that I'm not sure how accurate that is, but. Well, let, let, let's, funny to think. let's hope that's true. <laughs> yeah. well, you, well, you can see it probably, can't yeah. you? Because you, know, you, you say, I mean, everyone sort of says, you know, that McLuhan's a, a kind of rosy garden kind of technology. But you, you, as you know, being Canadian, he's not, is he, at all? Yeah. You know, he, he, he had a lot of negative things to say. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, well, I love, it, I love McLuhan. He is. He's great. And, I mean, talking about contradictions, I think, uh, 
he said uh, something like, I don't agree with half of the things I say. <laughs> so he's uh, he's definitely a contradiction that makes him amenable to, I guess, people who are uh, very optimistic about technology and can take him as, you know, the father of the internet or whatever. And then others who are very, um, are very pessimistic about technology and they can still use him. But I guess... Uh, just, just, I'll just expand on that. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with being contradictory. You know, I, 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 I think writing within your own kind of paradoxes and trying to understand them is part of the process. You know, it, it, that, that's to me what kind of theoretical exploration philosophy should be about. You know, I'm, I'm quite happy sometimes to start an article where I'm just arguing against myself for a while. It takes <laughs> ages to write the thing because obviously no one wants to read that particularly. But, um, you know, that's that's where you kind of end up where you are by, by p- pitching these two things against it themselves. Yeah, well, and you talk you talk about that in the book. And maybe of you, course, can, yeah, say, yeah. you can say a little bit more about the, these contradictions, I guess. As I'm as I'm hearing you and re- rethinking that part of the book, I'm curious. How do you know a a good or a useful contradiction that you can explore intellectually and that you can work with, like you're you're speaking about, versus a contradiction in that, um, you know, like I yeah I'm in I'm in the U S. and the U S. is a contradiction, of course, in many ways as a country that um, I, I'm always I'm always amazed how. Uh, driving down the highway um, going north during the holidays, I would see signs uh, for Jesus saves and for these kinds of things. And immediately under it would be basically stuff about getting buying guns. <laughs> or I would see things that are, um, you know, very sort of wholesome Christian values or whatever. And then the next sign would be for a Hooters or for a restaurant that's, you know, basically about objectifying women. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, so, yeah, so this sort of Puritan value and this non-Puritan value, I mean, to me, I see the potential for contradictions to be really useful and interesting and engaging. But then I also see contradictions in in the sense that um, they're not very useful or they're, they're just um, – they're leading to problems, I guess, in terms of uh, what we value or what decisions we make. How do you know a sort of good contradiction, or or what do you what do you look for in a contradiction that is that is helpful to you versus something that is simply, you know, just not well thought out? Right. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I, I suppose you know to think of things as being solved by the, the solving of contradiction as being well thought out is, is probably the wrong way to to start. But, you know rather look back to think about why are things contradicting in the first place and um, work within the contradiction more than just trying to solve it. I mean, you, you're never going to solve the issue around gun crime and, and, and puritanical religion. Are you? Uh, they, they almost seem contradictory, but uh, from my experience, they do go hand in hand. Surely America is not, the, oh, sorry, North America is not the only uh, paradoxical country. Every, every country is going to have some sort of uh, paradox of, of that kind. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, just to, just to get back a little bit, I, you know, maybe uh, talk a little bit more about our disciplines. You know, uh, one of the things I've been uh, thinking about writing, uh, and I've, I've just done some writing on it, is you know taking a kind of ambivalence or an ambivalent position. So that that, that maybe is slightly different to the kind of the, the, the paradoxical. Mm-hmm. You know, attacking things that you kind of have two two opinions about at the same time. So, for instance, you know, going back to the kind of interdisciplinary mixture, I thought it was interesting in a sense that interdisciplinary mixture is very kind of uh, creative. And we all know that once disciplines do kind of break down and, you know, there's a certain amount of novelty w- 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 which will emerge from there. But again, you know, as I was saying earlier, there's this uh, sort of erosion of criticality as well. So in, in, in ways you've got the same thing about almost like the religion and gun crime moving. They're moving together with each other. You know, you, 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 you're you trying to retain the criticality and you're also trying to uh, retain the kind of emergence of novel no, novelty. So maybe just riding that kind of ambivalent wave, traveling through uh, a problem in that way, rather than just trying to solve a problem by negation or, you know, some sort of uh, closing down of a contradiction. Yeah, and I guess that's a natural tendency is to want to solve a problem, uh, which I know I always... Uh, I, 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 try to stop myself in some cases from approaching certain situations in that way. But then just out of curiosity, how do you write a book or how do you write an article while being ambivalent? <laughs> you write about ambivalence. I, I, I did, you, you just reminded me, even in this book, I did a lot of stuff on remaining open to contradiction and paradox. I, I can't remember what context I did it with in the book. It's quite a while since I did that, but it's always been a, a, a trade. It's, you know, it's not just, just my work. 
I've been mm-hmm. influenced by others around around that. You know, eventually you have, probably have to come down and say something in the end around a con, uh, around a, a, a conclusion. But you know, to me, the conclusion is always just opening up to the next article you're going to write. So there's a continual flow between things. But I, I, I think we go go back to what we said originally here that, that although I might have a very dystopian point of view, I work in an environment where you know there's a lot of utopia mixed in with that. So I'm, I'm just trying to you know ne- negotiate my way through that. Yeah, the best I. No, and that's it's interesting. That I think makes a lot of sense, especially for people involved in technology, because there are those two extreme ways of looking at these things, right? Utopian and dystopian. And in reality, I think a lot of the things fall somewhere in the middle, and that's where we need to engage. Yeah, yeah. Or you, you, you say, you know, getting some balance back in, you know, some nuance. So, you know, rather, rather it being one extreme or the other extreme, maybe the role of, you know, the people like you you and me and, you know, that kind of theory thing is to just, you know, just introduce balance, just just roll things out. Hmm. So, yeah. Well, I guess one of my, one of my final questions for you is uh, where do you see your research going? What are some of the questions that uh, have piqued your interest in the last little while that you hope to pursue further? Well, okay. I, I'm planning to write. I've been a bit, bit busy of late with various other projects, but uh, I want to write a, a book around the experience. Uh, you would have noticed in the uh, in the assemblage brain that there was quite a lot around kind of the experience economy, user experience design, mm-hmm. as this kind of third paradigm of, of of computing design. And I wanted to really interrogate that whole notion of uh, of experience. Now this has taken me into some very sort of strange areas. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, of Whitehead, as you mm. might know, is a you know, huge influence on Deleuze, mm. lots, lots of other people. But um, he's you know he's the philosopher of experience, and I've written one article which is uh, for a journal called I, um, oh, what is it, uh, AI and Society, um, which isn't going to be out for quite some time. So I'm hoping to get some more kind of versions out around this. But it's how to use um, Whitehead's theory of, of, of experience or philosophy experience within the kind of HCI remit. It's it's very complicated, but I think I've tapped into some areas that might be interesting. And uh, this would, again, you know, uh, involve a lot of uh, kind of research into um, the kind of engineering aspects of experience design, uh, looking at the technologies behind it, but uh, working that through in a kind of a Whiteheadian way. So you can tell that I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious. Could you give me an example of what, what a Whiteheadian experience uh, or analysis of an experience would look like, sort of? Like what kind of things you're looking for through through that lens? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, one of the interesting things about uh, Whitehead is, you know, his idea that uh, space isn't just, you know, people in uh, kind of like a, a, a grid. So a, a user isn't in a grid using an object. We, we would look upon uh, the, 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 the interaction itself as being more important than the, the two things in a grid. So where you look at um, studies in HCI, there's a guy called Paul Dorish who uh, refers a lot to Heidegger, you know, that kind of phenomenal kind of viewpoint mm. of interaction. In a way, I think this is a bit cloudy between a number of, uh, of Whitehead books, but uh, Whitehead kicks against that phenomenal approach so you can completely reinvent the way in which you might study the interaction between a, a user and a mouse, for example. And this goes right away to sort of some more crazy ideas around pan, panpsychism, the way that it's not just the user experiences the technology, but the technology increasingly experiences the user, for example. Hmm. Um, you know, there's there's lots of different things. I don't want to go into too much detail because, hey, I've, <laughs> I've put that article to bed some time ago and um, I'd have to get it out and have a read of it. But there's some really interesting uh things that you can say about user interaction, user interaction experience design, particularly um, through, through using this, this philosophy. So that's yeah. one of the things I'm hoping to develop in the next, uh, next few months, actually. Yeah. Oh, that sounds cool. That's definitely interesting. And uh, I hope you do uh, pursue it and end up, I'm sure you'll end up with another great book and maybe we'll be able to talk again. Oh, great. Yeah. Tony, I really appreciate you uh, spending the time uh, talking and uh, I really yeah, I encourage people to pick up your book because even if you even if you don't have that kind of uh, neuroscience background or critical theory background, both of which I find can be really intimidating, it's just an interesting thing to think about because it's so so relevant to what's going on today in our world and the way we use technology. 
Okay, it was, it was really good talking to you, and, and thank you very much in your interest in the book. Uh, uh, yeah, it's very encouraging, that, uh, and it's a good thing to say about technology. That uh, you've contacted me out of the blue over the internet, and uh, here we are.